Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I'm Dr. Medora D'Souza Dias and I'm going to be presenting to you today's topic on nerve and ganglia histology. Let's look at some of the clinical aspects of nervous tissue like tumors of the brain or as you can see here, a patient with facial palsy or Bell's palsy wherein there is paralysis of half of the face. What is the structure of the nervous system? The nervous system is made up of sensory nerves which receive sensations like pain, touch, temperature, stretch and pressure from the external environment and they transmit this to the central nervous system which is the brain and spinal cord. In the central nervous system these messages are processed and sent via the motor nerves to the periphery to the affected tissues, the muscles, the glands and the viscera. Nervous tissue is made up of two types of cells. There's a neuron and the neuroglia. You have to think of the neuron sitting on a chair. So a neuron is sitting on a chair and it is being supported by the neuroglia. The neuroglia being the chair, insulate the neuron, support it, protect it and also help in conduction of the neuron. The neuron is the structural and functional unit of the nervous system whereas the neuroglia support. The human brain has more than one trillion neurons. Let's look at the structure and parts of the neuron. The neuron is made up of a cell body. The cell body has short branching processes like a tree which are called the dendrites. There is a long slender process which is called the axon and the axon ends in terminal boutons. If you look at the close up of the nerve cell body, it has a nucleus in the center and you can see the dendrites here. There are various organelles like the mitochondria, the green structures that you see here and the endoplasmic reticulum and a Golgi apparatus. The endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes make up collections that we call the Nissel's bodies. The Golgi complex and mitochondria are more in number in the axon of a neuron. There is also a pigment called lipofusion which is a residue of undigested material of lysosomes. The neuron also has a cytoskeleton made up of microtubules and neurofilaments. The neurofilaments are abundant in the cell body and they are bundled together. The microtubules help in transport of substances throughout the neuron. Remember always that the number of nerve cells never increases in your lifetime as nerve cells do not have functional centrioles. Let's look at details of the dendrites. Dendron means the tree and they are short like the tree branches and these receive impulses from the periphery or from other neurons. They can receive as many as 10,000 to 250,000 impulses from other axons or neurons. The axon I told you this axon is a long slender process which carries impulses away from the nerve cell body. The axon has an axolemma which is a covering sheath or the plasma membrane. There is an axonal transport system having an enterograde flow and a retrograde flow. The nerve fiber that we talk about in the peripheral nervous system is basically the axonal fibers. 
they form nerve tracts in the central nervous system. Let's summarize some differences between the axon and the dendrite. The axon is made up of a single long process whereas dendrites are multiple short, thick and tapering. An axon terminates away from the cell body where there is a dendrite terminates towards the cell body. An axon ends by dividing into axonal terminals. A dendrite forms a dendritic tree. An axon is of uniform diameter and it is smooth whereas a dendrite tapers and it is spiny. There are no nissel granules in the axon whereas there are nissel granules in the dendrite. Nerve impulses travel away from the cell body through an axon whereas a dendrite brings nerve impulses towards the cell body. Let's come to classification of neurons. What are the different types of neurons? There are various methods to classify neurons. The first method is by looking at the shape or you can also look at the structure. You could also decide the function of a neuron. Let's look at the first method of classifying a neuron based on the number of processes. So there are pseudo unipolar, bipolar and unipolar neurons. What is a unipolar neuron? A unipolar neuron like the mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal nerve has a single process coming out from the nerve cell body. What is a pseudo unipolar neuron? It's called pseudo unipolar because it has the false appearance of a unipolar neuron but actually it has a process coming out which branches into an axon and a dendrite like you can see here. These are found in the dorsal root ganglia along the dorsal root of the spinal cord. The third type you see in this figure here is a bipolar neuron having two processes coming out from the cell body and these are found in the bipolar cells of the human retina. Types of multipolar neurons. Multipolar neurons are further classified based on the shape of their cell body. They could be star shaped like you see here. They are called stellate multi multipolar neurons. They could be Purkinje which are flask shaped present in the cerebellum or they could be pyramidal like triangular shaped present in the cerebral cortex. The stellate multipolar neurons are the commonly found multipolar neurons present in the nervous system. There is also a concept of the interneuron like you see here in this diagram. Neurons can also be classified depending on their function. They could be sensory or motor like you see here. The first neuron that you see here is a sensory neuron. It is collecting information from the periphery and sending it towards the central nervous system. Whereas a motor neuron will send information from the central nervous system to the periphery, to the muscles and the glands. Neurons can also be classified based on the length of their axons. So there is Golgi type 1 with long axons and Golgi type 2 with shorter axons. The long axons or type 1 will connect places which are far away from each other. For example, the pyramidal cells of the motor cortex in the cerebrum is a remote region whereas short axons will contact smaller regions which are closer by like cells of Martinotti of the cerebral cortex and granule cells of the cerebellar cortex. Now let us study the structure of a synapse. What is a synapse? So you have one neuron meeting another neuron. That meeting place or that junction is called a synapse. Synapses could be classified depending on whether the axon synapses or the dendrites on synapses or the cell body synapses with an axon or a dendrite. Let us look at some types of synapses. They can be axodendritic. So if you look at this multipolar neuron, this is the axon of the multipolar neuron and this axon is meeting the dendrite. So this becomes an axodendritic type of synapse. 
The second type is an axosomatic that means the axon meets the nerve cell body. So this is called an axosomatic type. A third type that you can see in this diagram is axoaxonic. Axoaxonic means the axon of one neuron synapses with the axon of another neuron. Besides these three types, you can also get dendroaxonic, dendrodendritic, somatosomatic, and somatodendritic. Here you can see in this diagram a structure of a synapse. A synapse has three parts. There is the presynaptic part, the synaptic cleft which is a space between the presynaptic part and the postsynaptic part. So you have the presynaptic part, the synaptic cleft and a postsynaptic part. The synaptic cleft has a distance of about 20 to 50 nanometers in diameter. Let's summarize what we have studied so far. So far, we have studied the structure of the neuron. How do you classify a neuron based on various features like its length, its shape and its function? So we have talked about unipolar, pseudo-unipolar, bipolar and multipolar types of neurons based on the number of processes they have based on their function as sensory neurons or motor neurons. Based on the length of axons, we classify them as Golgi type 1 or long and Golgi type 2 or short. We have also spoken about a synapse. What is a synapse? A junction between two nerve cells and various types of synapses which we have commonly shown you, axoaxonic, axosomatic, axodendritic. And the structure of a synapse including the presynaptic part, the postsynaptic part and the synaptic cleft in between. Now let us proceed to the second part of the lecture. So we have done with neuron, now let us proceed to the neuroglial cells. Neuroglial cells are basically supportive cells, they are smaller cells and they are the chair on which the neuron sits. They provide various functions like insulation, protection, helping in conduction of nerve impulses and neuroglial cells are much more numerous. In fact, the number of glial cells in the brain and spinal cord is 10 to 50 times as much as that of the neurons. Neuroglial cells are classified based on whether they lie in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, you get ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, microglia and the astrocytes. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, you get Schwann cells and the satellite cells. Now let us study a few details about each of these cells we have mentioned. The first cell we would like to talk about is the ependymal cell. Now this ependymal cell lines the ventricles of the brain. You may have heard about fluid filled cavities within the cerebrum and cerebellum. These are called the ventricles and ependymal cells line these ventricles. In this diagram here you can see a layer of columnar or tall cuboidal cells which line the cavity called the ventricle. These cells develop from the neural tube and their function is to produce the cerebral spinal fluid. It has cilia on their surface and these cilia help in the circulation of this CSF. The second type of cell we are going to talk about is the astrocyte. Astro means star shaped so it has got many processes. Now astrocytes can be further classified as protoplasmic and fibrous astrocytes. As their name implies fibrous will be more thread like whereas the protoplasmic will have a fuller structure. So you can see in this diagram here the protoplasmic astrocyte and the fibrous astrocyte. Note the difference between the two. The protoplasmic astrocyte has got thicker processes and it has the end feet attached to the blood vessel. The fibrous astrocyte has long and thin processes 
fewer in number and they are present only in the white matter. You also get intermediate forms that are in between protoplasmic and fibrous. What are the functions of astrocytes? To provide nutrition to the neurons as they are attached to the capillary vessels. Let us talk about the oligodendrocytes and microglial cells. Oligodendrocytes are the myelin producing cells found in the central nervous system. One oligodendrocyte can provide myelin sheets to parts of more than one axon. Like you see here in this figure, this is one oligodendrocyte. It is sending processes to three neighboring axons and providing myelin sheets for them. Myelin sheath is a protective covering which protects the axon that it surrounds. Microglia, like you can see here in this figure, these are smaller cells and they have numerous processes branching out from them. They appear in large numbers in degenerative injuries of the central nervous system and their function is phagocytic. So they engulf foreign matter or the dead cells or whatever tissue needs to be removed. We have now studied neuroglial cells in the central nervous system. Let us talk about neuroglial cells in the peripheral nervous system. We mentioned two types, Schwann cells and satellite cells. The Schwann cells are the ones special cells which produce myelin sheets around the axons in the peripheral nervous system. So you can see here the Schwann cell forming layers of myelin sheets around an axon and that is the nucleus of the Schwann cell. As the cell rolls around the axon, the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell gets pushed to the periphery as well as its nucleus. There is an area which is left bare which is called the node of Ranvier which lies between consecutive Schwann cells. The function of the myelin produced by the Schwann cell is for faster conduction which is called saltatory conduction in the peripheral nervous system. The second type of neuroglial cell in the peripheral nervous system is the satellite cell. What is the meaning of satellite? It is something that lies around something else. Here we see a ganglion cell surrounded by a layer of flattened cells called satellite cells. These satellite cells form a kind of capsule around the ganglion cell. They protect it, they insulate it and they also provide pathways for metabolic exchange processes. In this slide here you can see there is one axon and there are three Schwann cells. Now how do these three Schwann cells form myelin sheets around this axon? So if you take a section you see the axon and the Schwann cell and the Schwann cell starts rolling around this axon. What happens later is it meets and then it spirals around further. What happens to the Schwann cell cytoplasm? The Schwann cell cytoplasm gets pushed to the periphery. That's why you find the nucleus also lying peripherally. This peripheral layer forms what we call the neurilemal sheath or the Schwann cell sheath and this sheath is very important when we talk about regeneration of axons. A neuron that has a neurilemal sheath around its axon can regenerate and can repair but absence of the neurilemal sheath means that neuron cannot repair itself. So in the peripheral nervous system the neurons can regenerate and can repair themselves because they have a neurilemal sheath but in the central nervous system where the oligodendrocyte forms the myelin sheath there is no neurilemal sheath and so the central nervous system neurons do not have the capacity to regenerate or repair. One Schwann cell produces myelin for one segment of an axon. So you need many Schwann cells arranged end to end to provide myelin sheets for the entire axonal length. What is a node of Ranvier? A node of Ranvier, you can see here in blue, this arrow shows you one node of Ranvier and you can see it on the other side of the axon as well. 
This is the space which is uncovered, which doesn't have a myelin sheath, which lies between two consecutive Schwann cells. And internode is the distance between two nodes of Ranvia. It's about 1 to 2 millimeters, which is the distance covered by one Schwann cell. Schmidt melantomen clefts, these are small amounts of cytoplasm or remnants that remain in the Schwann cells and they are important for their nutritive function. What are the functions of a myelin sheath? The myelin sheath is important because it protects the neuron. It also provides the nodes and internodes and this helps in a faster conduction called the saltatory conduction. Here you see the myelin sheath formed in the central nervous system. So in the central nervous system, the cell forming the myelin sheath is called the oligodendrocyte. There is one oligodendrocyte that can form myelin sheaths for several axons. Like you see here, there is one oligodendrocyte and it is forming myelin sheaths for three axons. And here you see how the spiraling takes place. But there is no neurilemmal sheath, so there will be no regeneration or repair of neurons in the central nervous system. Always remember this. Now all this time we are talking about myelination, myelinated nerve fibers in the central nervous system, in the peripheral nervous system. What about unmyelinated nerve fibers? They are also called non-myelinated nerve fibers. They have no myelin sheaths. If you look here, you can see there are three axons. There is a Schwann cell in pink. The Schwann cell is covering the axons, but there is a small space that is left out here. And there is no spiraling around the axon. These are unmyelinated axons and they are not protected. They are not sheathed. Let's summarize differences between myelinated axons and unmyelinated or non-myelinated axons. Myelinated axons usually have a larger diameter, whereas unmyelinated axons are usually of a smaller diameter. The myelinated axons are surrounded by concentric layers of Schwann cell, cytoplasm and plasma membrane, whereas in the unmyelinated axons are surrounded just by cytoplasm of Schwann cells. In myelinated, a single axon is surrounded by many Schwann cells. In unmyelinated, groups of axons are invaginated by a single Schwann cell. In myelinated axons, nerve impulses jump from one node to the next node. Whereas in unmyelinated axons, the impulses travel along the axolemma. Conduction is faster in myelinated, whereas it is much slower in unmyelinated and it also consumes much more energy. Here at a glance you can see the three different types of processes we are talking about. The first one above is an unmyelinated axon. There is no myelin sheath. The second figure that you see here is the process of myelination in the peripheral nervous system and last you can see the process of myelination in the central nervous system. Let's summarize what we have just studied. We have spoken about the neuroglial cells of the central nervous system like the ependymal cells, the microglia, the two types of astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes. We have also spoken about the neuroglial cells in the peripheral nervous system like the Schwann cells and the satellite cells. Then we have talked about the process of myelination. What is myelination in the central nervous system and how it takes place with the oligodendrocytes and in the peripheral nervous system myelin sheets formed by the Schwann cells. We have spoken about differences between these two myelination processes. We have also mentioned the non-myelinated or unmyelinated axons. Last we were talking about the nodes of Ranvia and what is internode, a space between two nodes of Ranvia and the distance covered by one Schwann cell. 
Let us move on now to the actual peripheral nerve. A peripheral nerve is outside the central nervous system and these nerve fibers are grouped into bundles and they form nerves. Now there could be two types of fibers. There are afferent fibers like you see in this figure above here. The afferent fibers collect impulses from the periphery like pain, touch, temperature and send this information to the central nervous system. So these are called afferent nerve fibers. The second type are the efferent fibers which bring messages to the periphery from the central nervous system. You will notice when you do dissection that the nerves have a whitish color. Nerves are whitish because of the myelin that they contain. Myelin gives it a whitish appearance. If you take a section of a nerve grossly and histologically, you will find it broken down into smaller components. So that's the full nerve covered by a very strong, tense, thick sheet of collagen fibers called the epineurium. Epi meaning outer. So this full thing that you see here, a thick, dense layer is called the epineurium. The epineurium sends septae into the nerve which divide the nerve into bundles also called fascicles. Each fascicle is covered by an extension of the epineurium which is called the perineurium. The perineurium will now contain a bundle of nerve fibers. Each nerve fiber is covered by a very delicate layer of connective tissue called the endoneurium. Endo meaning inner. The endoneurium covers each nerve fiber and you can see here when we break it down, each endoneurium covered nerve fiber and the central dot is the axon. You can see here the Schwann cell and the Schwann cell has rolled around this axon to produce the myelin sheath. The blue structure here that you see is the axon which lies in the center. So there is the epineurium extensions forming perineurium which cover fascicles of nerve fibers and a fascicle is made up of various axons covered by their myelin sheets like you can see here and the Schwann cell nuclei. You can also get fibroblast nuclei between nerve fibers. This is a low pass light stained with hematoxylin and neosin of the peripheral nerve. You can see the nerve fibers are long, they are slightly wavy and you can see in this slide, these are the extensions called the perineurium which cover a fascicle of nerve fibers. The nerve fibers will show nuclei in between. These will be nuclei of the Schwann cells and nuclei of the fibroblasts in the endoneurium. On a hyper view, in the same slide, seen under a hyper, you can see the perineurium here and you can see the slightly wavy nerve fibers. An illustration done shows you the wavy nerve fibers, the perineurium which is an extension of the endoneurium. What we just saw was a longitudinal section passing through a peripheral nerve. The other way of studying a peripheral nerve is taking a transverse section. What do you mean by a longitudinal section? If you take a nerve, cutting it along its length is a longitudinal section. If we cut it across its length, it is a transverse section. Let us look at the transverse section of a peripheral nerve. So this is the slide where you can see fascicles of nerve fibers or bundles of nerve fibers, each surrounded by a perineurium and overall the nerve is surrounded by an epineurium. Inside you can see in the fascicle individual nerve fibers with a transparentish layer around the axons which would be the myelin and you can see blood vessels coursing between the fascicles of nerve fibers. A high power view of the same slide will show you one fascicle covered by a perineurium and you can see each dot here in the center these are the axons and the white 
peripheral substance is the myelin which does not stain with hematoxin neosin and the line around it is the endoneurium as well as the Schwann cell cytoplasm and maybe a Schwann cell nucleus. In the illustration here you can see the same thing, there are the fascicles, there is a perineurium, each individual nerve fiber and axon, nuclear of the Schwann cells, nuclear of the fibroblasts. Now we were talking about nodes of Ranvier. You can study a node of Ranvier by doing a special stain of nerve fibers with osmic acid. When you stain the nerve fiber, a myelinated nerve fiber with osmic acid, the myelin stains a dark brown or blackish color. So here you can see these are all nerve fibers and you can see a small constriction here. So that will be a node of Ranvier between two segments covered by the Schwann cell. If you look at an illustration of this kind of diagram, that is the node of Ranvier and you can see the axon and what stains is the myelin sheath. Let us summarize what we have just covered. The nerve is outside the central nervous system, the nerve fibers are grouped into bundles and this forms nerves. There are afferent fibers and efferent fibers. Efferent carry sensation from the periphery to the central nervous system, efferent carry motor impulses from the central nervous system to the periphery. Most of the nerves have a whitish appearance. This is because the myelin and the collagen content gives it a whitish color. The peripheral nerve we have looked at in a longitudinal section and a transverse section. We have seen nerve fibers grouped in bundles called fascicles and the fascicles collect together to form the entire nerve. Epineurium is a dense connective tissue covering the entire nerve. Each fascicle is then covered by a perineurium and the innermost delicate lining is the endoneurium covering each single nerve fiber. Let us now proceed to study about ganglia. What are ganglia? Ganglia are collections of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system. For example, you all must have heard of cranial nerve ganglia or spinal nerve ganglia or sympathetic ganglia or even parasympathetic ganglia. So all these lie outside the central nervous system and they are classified like I have already mentioned. Let us look at a sensory ganglion. An example of a sensory ganglion is the spinal ganglion. This lies in the dorsal root of the spinal cord and a spinal ganglion has a peripheral processes which relay here and then the axon takes the messages up into the central nervous system. If you look at a slide of spinal ganglion in the lower power, you can see that full thing here. This is the spinal ganglion and the small purple bodies that you see, these are the ganglion cells. The pink fibers that you see are the nerve fibers which course through a ganglion. These type of ganglion cells are the pseudo unipolar cells that we spoke about. Do you remember the pseudo unipolar cells? So they are the ones which have one process but that one process then bifurcates like a T giving you the dendrite and the axon. If you look at a high power view of the spinal ganglion, you see each nerve cell has a large shape ovalish or round with a central spherical nucleus and a very well defined layer of satellite cells. Do you remember the satellite cells? These are the supportive neuroglial cells of the peripheral nervous system. Let us look at this illustration below. So you can see a large ganglion cell of a pseudo unipolar ganglion with a centrally placed nucleus and a well developed nicely seen layer of satellite cells forming a capsule around the ganglion cell. Between the ganglion cells you will get many nerve fibers. The other type of ganglia are called the autonomic ganglia 
and these are mostly concerned with supply to the smooth muscle and the glands. They can be preganglionic and postganglionic fibers. These ganglia lie outside the central nervous system and they are divided into a sympathetic type and a parasympathetic type. These neurons are multipolar. Do you remember what is multipolar? Star shaped or stellate shaped having many processes. A slide of a sympathetic ganglion shows you many nerve cells and nerve fibers. This ganglion is covered by a thin capsule of connective tissue and it has many multipolar neurons which are smaller in size and they have eccentrically placed nuclei. Because the ganglion cells are multipolar, the satellite cells will not be very well arranged around them. So if you look at a high power view of the slide, you see here. These are the ganglion cells. They have edges and they have eccentrically placed nucleus, not in the center. And there are many myelinated and unmyelinated nerve fibers coursing through the ganglion. If you look at an illustration, this is what you see. The cells are smaller and they have an eccentrically placed nucleus and you get a lot of nerve fibers coursing through the ganglion, separating the cell bodies from each other. Let's summarize differences between sensory ganglia and sympathetic or autonomic ganglia. Sensory ganglia cell bodies are larger and they are of the unipolar type or the pseudo unipolar type. Whereas the autonomic ganglia cell bodies are smaller and of the multipolar type. In the sensory ganglia nuclei are central and the autonomic ganglia nuclei are eccentric meaning they lie towards one side. In the sensory ganglia, cell bodies are arranged in loops or clusters, whereas in the autonomic ganglia, cell bodies do not form groups and they are scattered. Sensory ganglia has myelinated nerve fibers in groups, whereas autonomic has unmyelinated fibers scattered. Sensory ganglia, the cells have got prominent satellite cells around them, whereas in autonomic, the ganglion cells have satellite cells which are less prominent. Sensory ganglia have a well-defined connective tissue capsule, whereas autonomic ganglia have almost an absent connective tissue capsule. Let's look at some of the clinically applied aspects of nerves and ganglia. Multiple sclerosis is a condition wherein there is degeneration of the myelin which is formed by oligodendrocytes. But the myelin formed by Schwann cells is spared. So this affects only the nerves in the central nervous system and not in the peripheral nervous system. There can be paralysis of nerves in bedridden patients because of pressure on a nerve. So pressure on a nerve tends to compress the nerve and it compromises the blood supply to the nerve. Another clinical aspect is neuritis. Neuritis is an inflammation of the nerve Ischemic neuritis means the pain is because of loss of blood supply to the nerve. This picture that you see here, this is the clinical features in Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a paralysis of the facial nerve and when the patient tries to close his eyes or smile, this is what happens and this is the paralyzed side where the eye closure is affected and the, there is no deviation of the angle of the mouth on the affected side. Regeneration of peripheral nerves. We already spoke about repair and regeneration and we mentioned that repair and regeneration cannot take part in the central nervous system because there is no neurilemal sheath in the central nervous system. Whereas repair and regeneration can only occur in the nerves of the peripheral nervous system. There is a syndrome called GB syndrome, also called the Guillain-Barre syndrome, which affects the peripheral nervous system. It is an autoimmune disorder and it usually follows some type of bacterial or viral infection. There is pain because of loss of blood supply to the nerve and there is progressive ascending weakness of the lower limbs followed by upper portions of the body diminished tendon reflexes and autonomic dysfunction. There is infiltration of the endoneurium and demyelination. 
This is then followed by a recovery and remyelination. Gliomas are tumors of the nervous system, but remember, mature nerve cells or mature neurons are not capable of division. So, tumors are rarely from the nerve cells, they are mostly from the glial cells. So, you could classify tumors of the nervous system, whether they are astrocytomas, oligodendromas, ependymomas, schwannomas are tumors of the Schwann cells of the peripheral nervous system. You can even get medulloblastomas which are tumors of immature nerve cells. Let us summarize everything that we have done today. So, our topic for today was the nerve and ganglia histology. When we spoke about nerve, we started with the definition of a neuron and its parts, the nerve cell body, the dendritic tree and the axon. We spoke about types of neurons based on number of processes like unipolar, pseudounipolar, bipolar and multipolar. Based on its function, afferent, efferent or sensory and motor. Based on its shape, Purkinje cells, pyramidal cells, stellate cells or you have something called the interneuron also. We spoke about glial cells, glial cells in the central nervous system, glial cells in the peripheral nervous system, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, the microglial cells and astrocytes. We spoke about neuroglial cells in the peripheral nervous system like the Schwann cells and the satellite cells. We have gone through the myelination theory, how myelination takes place in the central nervous system by the oligodendrocyte and in the peripheral nervous system by the Schwann cell. We have spoken about unmyelinated or non-myelinated axons. Last we came to ganglia, sensory ganglia, autonomic ganglia, differences between the two, the supportive cells being the satellite cells and we also spoke about some of the clinical aspects like neuritis, Bell's palsy, tumors of nervous tissue and uh, neuritis. And with that, we have completed our topic for today. Thank you.